as many of you know, the Elk Street Health Spot is our monthly health fair that traditionally was held in front of the School of Social Work that partnered individuals with the community and partnered uh, Tulane with agencies that work within the community and gave us a great opportunity for networking and service. Um, when the um, when COVID-19 came upon us, what we decided to do was to transfer that opportunity of networking and knowledge sharing to a webinar platform. So today we have uh, Dr. Reggie Ferreira and his team who will talk about climate change and resiliency. And so um, I'm gonna pass it off to Dr. Ferreira because his program is so huge, he'll tell you all about it. Hopefully some of you will have interest in what they provide and um, you will join us at Tulane for our programs. Thank you so much, Dr. Hayes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for taking time to join us this afternoon. First off, Happy New Year. And I hope you and your loved ones are safe from COVID-19 and other disasters that's happening around the world. We're really in challenging times. Um, as Dr. Hayes mentioned, you know, today our focus is on, on the intersection of climate change, equity, um, and adaptation in general, you know, it's, um, today we're gonna be sharing our expertise. You know, we have a really strong team here at Derla, um, really national and international experts working within the field of climate change. Um, you know, and we're gonna be touching by sort of on the overlooked topic of equity within this field. Um, first off, thank you again for attending today. We really appreciate you taking time out of your schedules. Um, to Dr. Hayes and Dr. Parquet and Jeremy, thank you so much for what you do for Tulane School of Social Work and organizing the whole spot um, for us. And then also for Carrie, um, you know, ensuring that everything is working today. Um, and then most important, the panelists. Um, I know you're all very busy. Um, and some of you are on the front lines as we speak. Um, so thank you so much for taking time today. So I'm going to be sharing a PowerPoint with you all here. Um, there we go. Okay. Which one are you all seeing? The smaller one or the bigger one? We see the full screen. Yeah, it? I think you're good, Reggie. Okay, thank you. So folks, um, I'm gonna be sharing, you might wonder what the acronym DERLA is. Um, it's the Disaster Resilience Leadership Academy. I'm gonna give a brief overview. Um, my right-hand person, um, Tona Zwan Ziger is also with us today, who's also a graduate of the program and our program manager. Um, she'll be helping me with the overview. And then we'll delve into equitable adaptation and climate resilience. And um, our esteemed panel will be um, answering or discussing um, you know, some questions related to their work and just equity within our space. And then we're going to open it up to you, the audience, for a Q&A. So we are based within the School of Social Work. It's very unique, our approach that we have at Derla, you know, it's human-centered. It's looking at the human element that's often forgotten during disaster. Um, we are very holistic with our work that we do. Um, you know, we look at the physical environment, the socioeconomic, political institutions, but most important, you know, the vulnerable aspects of, or vulnerability within the context of disasters. Um, if we were to look at our mission, it's also a very unique mission and it aligns with the School of Social Work's mission, um, you know, is really addressing the root causes of vulnerability, but also ensuring, you know, that our students are aware of human diversity, equity, and the importance of promoting social and environmental justice. Tona? Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. So. Um, some interesting numbers here. I'm not sure if I can read them all. I'll let you read them at your um, at your leisure. Uh, I am a graduate of both the MSW and the MS program at Durla, and I was most interested in the MS program because of my history of work in the military. I was in the um, um, I was a combat medic for ten years in the army, and so that's what really got me geared up when I heard of um, the Durla program. I uh, was here as well for Hurricane Katrina. And so I've seen firsthand over my adult years, the significance and importance of leadership uh, when disaster, disaster strikes an area, not only in the aftermath of the event, which is where most focus and attention is paid, 
but also to pay attention to the ways in which we can plan better on the front end and pre-event so that the impact is not so significant on the back end. Back to you, Reggie. Thank you, Tona. Mm -hmm. So folks, um, some of our notable fellows and um, staff that's associated with the program and several of them are on our panel today. Um, you know, so we're going to get to introducing them in a, in a few minutes. Um, but we really have, as I mentioned, some of the national, international leaders within the space of disaster resilience leadership. Um, like, for instance, Josh Human, who we have, he's with BRIC, um, FEMA's BRIC Partnership Lead. Um, we have Robin Keegan, who is Assistant Secretary for Housing and Urban Development. And then, of course, our other folks who are actually on the slide is also on the panel. You know, they'll be introducing themselves and the amazing work they do. So just some last aspects about Durla, you know, we have a very heavy focus on research and academic excellence, you know, we're guided by the National Disaster Recovery Framework by FEMA, um, but also, you know, the Paris Climate Change Agreement, the Sendai Framework, the Sustainable Development Goals all guide us to ensure, you know, that equity is achieved at the end of the day, or at least practiced, you know, it's not always achieved. Um, yeah, we have a local to, local to global practice um, aspect that we take. There's valuable lessons here from our own backyard, but then there's also valuable lessons across the globe, you know, that can be implemented. Um, another unique aspect about Derla and Tulane in general, um, we're one of only four institutions in the FEMA Region 6, um, you know, so that really is something we are very proud of. And then also, you know, our focus on social and environmental justice is really unmatched. Um, you know, we have two leading experts here in um, Monica Sanders and Alessandra Yeroleman, who's working on the front lines as it relates to social justice and environmental justice. So our panelists today is Monica Sanders, Senior Fellow with Derla, Alessandra Yeroleman, Dr. Yeroleman, um, it's also a senior fellow with Derla. Tona is with us, um, program manager. Then for Ross Kahn, who's a recent Derla graduate and um, is now at Dillard University. Um, he was also our standout student last year. Then we have Corey Ide, who's also a Tulane alum and senior fellow. And then we have Mark Rogers, who's a fellow of the program and also a Derla graduate. So before we start today, um, you know, sort of introduction to our session, you know, we've seen quite a significant increase in disasters, you know, just the past two years in the Gulf alone, you know, with the hurricanes that's been battering the Gulf Coast, um, wildfires out in California, and then in my native South Africa, you know, flooding taking place currently. I don't know if you all have been following the media, what's been happening in, um, in Mozambique and Malawi, you know, significant flooding taking place. There's heat waves in Paraguay, you know, so it's quite grim what's happening at this stage you know, and oftentimes and most of the time the most vulnerable are being impacted by these disasters um, and the underserved you know the gap is just becoming bigger and bigger you know with underserved populations not getting equitable access um, to post-disaster relief and are also not included you know with recovery planning and resilience planning in general um, you know these deficiencies in service delivery can be um, there's several reasons why it happens, you know, it ranges from imperialism, structural barriers that takes place, um, marginalized, marginalization, and then also racism and classism. Um, you know, so the academy, we really try and train the students that they're aware of these issues and come up with innovative solutions to address it. Um, so today our panelists will really be sharing their expertise working within the space of um, climate change, adaptation and resilience in general, um, and their work, you know, with underserved um, individuals, households and communities. Um, so the panelists, you know, we've been working on this um, webinar for some time, you know, I've shared some questions with with them for today, but um, you know what, what they're going to be focusing on is their current role with the academy also their current community practice um what does equity mean for them you know within the space of adaptation and climate resilience um they're going to be sharing some of their expertise um and experiences with hurricane ida um you know most of not all of them were actually on the front lines and helping out um, communities whether it was planning or on the ground with response. Um, then we're going to sort of round off their discussion with what's next for us in this space. Um, you know, how can we bring about real change? And there's a lot of talk 
um, across the globe, you know, about all these programs, but oftentimes it's just talk, you know, no real action. Um, yeah, and then, you know, they're going to sharing, be sharing some advice, you know, where you can actually start, you know, if you want to get involved in this space, um, and then just share some additional um, advice. So I'm going to be handing it over to the panel. Um, so yeah, thank you, folks. So can I maybe have a volunteer amongst the panel who would like to go first? Thank you, Corey. Happy to happy to kick this off, and I'll keep my comments relatively quick because, frankly, I'm I'm looking forward to to listening and learning from everyone else here. But uh, very nice to meet everyone today. As as Reggie indicated, my name is Corey Iad. I'm a senior fellow at uh, Derla, and uh, very fortunate to have come out of Tulane, um, uh, formerly in the International Development Program, and have been with Derla for about uh, six or seven years now, which is just a treat of an opportunity. Uh, to complement that, I currently uh, am the Director of Community Resilience, uh, which is a consulting practice for BDO USA, which historically, uh, if folks are familiar with it, has historically been an accounting and auditing firm, but over the last 10 years or so is really in the process of uh, transforming itself into a consulting organization supporting local and states and nonprofits um, across the country and in my particular area really helping uh, local government nonprofits and healthcare really seize the moment we're in to invest in resilience, uh, hopefully well before, and then all the way to recovering from disasters. So just uh, maybe three quick points from me, and then uh, I'll hand it over. You know, I think uh, the question that was asked, um, and I'll drop a quick link here to uh, the, the work we're doing at BDO. Uh, which will guide some of my comments around Hurricane Ida. But the question of what does equity mean, I think there's there's many individuals, especially on this panel, that are far more, um, that frankly, I'm, I'm much more interested in listening to them answer this question. But a couple of things that I will frame in terms of what we are doing within Derla, and specifically whether it's in our leadership and disaster course, or whether it's in our disaster operations and policy course, we really try to attempt to humanize not only these academic concepts, but frankly, the politics that are playing out in our communities left and right. It's very easy to read headlines. It's very easy to listen to sound bites and forget the fact that there are people at the forefront and then the crosshairs of every single one of these topics. Uh, and myself recognizing the, the resources and privilege that I've benefited from my life, we in these courses really attempt to ensure that from a faculty perspective, we're positioning ourselves to learn just as much from uh, the students in this course as we are hoping to be able to, to share and instill within them. You know, and then we, we move to try to attempt to, to really embody and make real, you know, these visceral changes that are happening in our climate and the, the results of what we've reaped long before or what we've sown long before in many generations before us and even in our lifestyles the decisions that we've made that we're now reaping as a society you know growing up in, in southern california i have always known the threats and the reality of wildfires but as we've seen you know in plenty of headlines in the last few years never never ever have we experienced the regularity or the severity in which we're experiencing wildfires as an example, nor have families, uh, myself with three little kids, had to keep our windows closed for weeks on end because of the hazardous air that is just outside our doors um, that is a threat to our children. And frankly, you know, my children benefit from uh, having the ability to close windows and, and not be as exposed uh, to many frontline communities that are experiencing that. And so our students are having to navigate this concept of equity and putting, uh, ensuring that we're creating space for others to drive conversation and ensuring that policymakers uh, are checking their resources and privilege and, you know, hopeful return on investment at the door. You know, one other example I would frame from a, from a classroom perspective is, you know, we have students at Derla, and it's, I think, one of the, the treats of Derla is we have students that are dispersed across the country. And so these are students that are navigating the realities of climate change and what does it mean to adapt to these realities 
you know, literally across the country, you know, real time, we had students navigating the horrors of the Marshall fire as they lived just outside of the burn area in Colorado. At the same time, we have students that are emergency room nurses that are literally providing frontline care and services to uh, historically vulnerable populations in parts of Kentucky at the same time as they're navigating, how are they going to respond to tornadoes that are hitting their communities what seemed to be on a on an incredible pace and then just lastly you know equity from uh, kind of my practice area at bdo is you know, one of the key areas that we're supporting from a hurricane ida perspective is actually not within the state of louisiana it's actually in the state of new york and in the state of connecticut uh, with public housing authorities that were impacted by hurricane ida and you know New York was in the headlines for a hot moment when Hurricane Ida surprised New York, but Connecticut never made the national headlines from Hurricane Ida. And so we are supporting, you know, uh, clients navigate the disaster recovery process and the financial recovery process to ensure that they can, um, you know, their clients, their, their residents, you know, have access to information to be able to help recover you know, advocacy um, from all angles of how do those, how do those individuals advocate for themselves, and how do individuals with more resources and authority, you know, formal authority, advocate on their behalf uh, for their recovery. And just a couple last things for me, you know, in terms of what's next, uh, actually one last thing for me, in terms of what's next, I really believe, um, and I'll put it from a practice perspective, uh, now operating in a role of, of a consultant, which is new to me, um, is we're preparing state and local governments uh, and our client and our students really to seize the historic moment that we're in, not only pre-COVID-19, where there really was a reckoning, a social reckoning and environmental reckoning kind of at a precipice, COVID-19 put that over the precipice and we are living in a historic moment where federal stimulus funds are coming into communities across the United States in ways that it's never occurred before. And so we're advising local and state governments and sometimes this is, you know, government entities of 8,000 residents and sometimes this is some of the largest states in the country to really make sure that generational equity is the forefront of the lens in which our government officials are determining how to spend these dollars, ensuring that wide and deep uh, stakeholder engagement is occurring before decisions are made on how to spend these dollars. And then simultaneously recognizing that in many places, you know, there weren't a lot of resources there in the beginning. And so you're still not dealing with a lot of financial resources, but in many places, it's a historic game changing moment. And so we are attempting to advise around really the through line from the CARES Act stimulus, the American Rescue Plan Act uh, funding, the recent infrastructure, infrastructure and Jobs Act, and all the way through the mitigation programs that FEMA has and making sure that before quick decisions are made, we're making those decisions as communities through that through line of, hey, where do we have the greatest opportunity for generational equity to make sure our communities are as safe as possible and that we're adapting to the realities of climate change and that frankly, you know, we're attempting to set people up to thrive as much as they could ever possibly hope to coming out of a pandemic. So with that, um, thank you very much for the opportunity and I'll hand it over to the next speaker. I'll go ahead and go. <clears throat> Thanks, Corey. Uh, yeah, my name is Mark Rogers. I am a graduate of the Derwood program and currently an adjunct professor and fellow there. I am, when I'm not teaching at Derwood, I work at Team Rubicon and I am the manager of program support. My role, well, first, let me tell you a little bit more about Team Rubicon. Team Rubicon is a nonprofit disaster response organization. Uh, we were funded or started by military veterans and a majority of our work or all of our work is done by volunteers. We have 150,000 plus volunteers throughout the country, uh, most of them being military veterans, first responders. Um, and we help communities respond, recover and prepare for disasters and humanitarian crisis, both domestically and internationally. 
Um, my work at Team Rubicon, I, yeah, the manager of program support, and I focus on helping do program development and refinement. So work with internal and external stakeholders to help scope our work. You know, what do we do in the field? What do we not do in the field? What supplies and equipment do we need in order to do that? What, you know, skill set do we need for our volunteers? Maybe training opportunities as well. And then what does success look like? When, when are we done with any operation? And then how do we measure that? When we were talking about equity and, you know, Corey touched on this about humanizing it from the classroom, the, the academic perspective, it made me think a lot about what we do in the field at TR or how we, you know, find our operations. And there's a couple of things that I wanted to bring up uh, in response to that. So we are really adamant about localizing our responses as much as possible. You know, we have, we have the capability, we do often fly people in from all the different corners and areas, regions throughout America to go into Louisiana or go into Kentucky or go to the wildfires in Colorado or California. But how can we really localize our responses to where we have gray shirts, we have volunteers in those communities who know those communities best? You know, they know um, the, the nuances of, of the social, the political, um, the emotional fabric and the ties in that community so that the responses are, are that much more humanized and that much more um, unique to that, to that community and their needs. We do on a, on a national level use GIS software. We do look at SVI data. You know, we target those communities uh, in the path of destruction post hazard event to, to ensure that we're going to uh, the most underserved populations, kind of what Reggie was talking about at the very beginning ensuring that you know those who don't have the resources financially or socially to to rebuild themselves or to recover on their own that we are there to assist them you know our services are provided 100 percent for free so we want to make sure that we are helping the community holistically recover from any hazard event um, a couple of the more recent things that we've been working on at team rubicon uh, and then something we've been doing for the last few years as we're talking about equity and adaptation and resiliency is we have this program called Rebuild that started after Hurricane Harvey down in Houston, where we rebuild homes uh, for, for individuals and families in the, uh, and communities throughout America. It started with a focus on Houston, but now we're starting to expand that out to different areas throughout the country and very similar to, you know, trying to target the most underserved or vulnerable populations. We do that same thing with a uh, more thorough analysis for the rebuild program as well, where we could, re could be helping that family or that homeowner rebuild part of their home or all the entire home if needed. Another thing that we're doing is, uh, you know, we've been working over the last several months with refugee resettlement, specifically in Af uh, Afghan families uh, who are starting to transition and build lives here in America. So we've taken on donation management a lot, uh, working with partners like Department of Defense, Department of State, Health and Human Services, International Rescue Committee, just to name a few. And a lot of these individuals only came to America with the clothing on their back. And so we, initially focus on those immediate needs of getting clean clothes um, for babies, getting diapers, baby formula, uh, hygiene supplies as well. And now we are starting to expand as they're transitioning from the military bases into more permanent living situations, whether an apartment or home, really focusing in on uh, providing them bedding, materials, uh, kitchen supplies, um, furniture, things of that nature. To, to help you know them um, have that that um, process begin a little faster for them, and it just makes me come back to what Corey was talking about in terms of humanizing their experience and really trying to help them um, have the best life that they can now that they are transitioning to a new life. The last thing I wanted to bring up is just our work with the COVID-19 vaccine uh, distribution throughout the country earlier uh, in 2021. You know, we did a lot of work to 
work with uh, Starbucks, for example, to, to figure out how can we really distribute or help distribute vaccines in the most equitable fashion. And we went through a lot of designing sessions, ideation sessions of like, where do people most frequent uh, or where, where do people most frequent in their community? What places, what areas, you know? So we would talk about bus stops or, or community centers or where people would walk, right? Um, and then the user experience of how we set up mobile vaccination sites. Like, you know, so if we know these are uh, areas that are very popular in the community, how can we set up mobile vac vaccination sites that are open um, and accessible to people who don't have cars, who, who maybe don't speak English, who um, work outside of the hours of nine to five. Uh, so what, what does that look like and how can we be uh, providing the best resource to the communities for those who do want to get vaccinated? So what's next? What, what, um, what do we do now or, yeah, I guess, my thought or my thinking is the building of relationships. So, you know, we want to localize our volunteer base. We want to have the community represented so that those voices, those perspectives are captured um, and we are providing the most holistic approach as, as possible. But what we can do, even if you're not with TR or with any other organization is, you know, meet our neighbors, make plans with our neighbors, um, pressure local leaders and your elected officials uh, to, to build plans with everyone in mind, with everyone um, you know, thought of before and post disaster. And then the next thing is, you know, obviously I, I do work for a volunteer organization, so it'd be a shame if I didn't, but you, know, you can volunteer with Team Rubicon, volunteer with other organizations as well. Uh, if it's something you're very passionate about, you can also find a job and work on it uh that much more of your time and then you know there's always opportunities to donate and things like that but i think more than anything uh when we come back to equity i think about building relationships i think it's about um making everyone's voices heard and if you want more information i will be sure to share contact info with uh reggie who will push that out to everyone but i will stop there and pass it on I'll go ahead and, and, and pick it up then. I'm gonna share um, just some slides for a little bit of a background. Well, I'm a senior fellow at Durla. I teach the disaster operations and policy course as well as the economics of disaster recovery. And my research focuses a great deal on the intersection between justice, equity and disaster recovery. But also I do look at climate adaptation, climate resilience in particular with an eye towards those communities who tend to be left out. So small rural communities, indigenous communities, people who are deeply connected to place, the people who we hear about on the news on the rare occasion that we do see some concern and outcry for the fact that folks are not receiving assistance. And I also do some work with the Lowlander Center, which is an applied research center located in Gray, Louisiana, that works closely with coastal communities. And I'll talk a little bit about my work with them following Hurricane Ida. As far as the question of equity and what it means in this context, the way I think of equity is I think of it as making sure that people have access to the networks, supports, resources, and opportunities, the things that they need to survive and to thrive to get to where they want to go. So equity is not the equal application of program rules and regulations that perpetuate systemic injustice. Equity is not treating everybody exactly the same. Equity is really focusing on outcomes and needs and acknowledging the histories of oppression, among other things, that really leave folks starting from different places in terms of things like intergenerational wealth or the geography of risk where they live. A lot of research, as well as my own experience working on this for the past two decades, has shown that there are consistently disparate outcomes following disasters. There are also considerably disparate outcomes when you look at what happens in the name of climate adaptation. There are barriers to access for resources. 
and communities are treated very differently depending upon the value, the financial monetary value of their assets and the infrastructure, and dependent upon the public and governmental perceptions of their rights to the land. So for example, we treat small coastal indigenous communities as perhaps needing to retreat without having the same conversation for high rises in Miami, or at least not having it in the same ways. Certainly that is a conversation that's happening nationally. We also know that our basic aid programs aren't really designed to guarantee basic human rights. They treat people like renters differently than those who own land. And we also know that displacement is a common outcome of disasters. In my mind, equity is intricately connected to justice. And these issues play out, as I've said, very clearly in the disaster recovery space. In my work, I've proposed four principles for ensuring more just outcomes in recovery that I think apply to climate adaptation as well. The first is being certain that all community members can exercise their agency through free and informed choice. The second is that any different or unequal treatment has to be justified by the discriminator. The third is to harness community transformative and adaptive capacity while honoring community definitions of resilience. And the fourth is that equal access to resources and programs must be guaranteed, including full participation in decision-making processes. So I want to talk briefly about Hurricane Ida. As you're all aware, Hurricane Ida devastated communities along the Louisiana Gulf Coast before moving inland and causing devastation as far as New York. Along the coast, Hurricane Ida came in over Point Ocean by Montague, Louisiana leaving vast devastation to those communities that have a very high percentage of tribal residents. They had a very long power outage, more than a month, self-service disruptions, no access to food or water, no access to gas, very little government support. And these were communities that were already facing substantial challenges. In my community work, I've been working with folks in these communities for the last 15 years. So as Hurricane Ida was coming in, we were already looking to see what some of the needs and challenges might be, thinking about things such as how to provide access to cell service and internet so folks could interface with government programs, thinking about how to use a position a little more far removed, I had the ability to evacuate, for example, to advocate and to look for resources. I was able to bring some media attention to the needs uh, due to my previous research, I was asked for a few interviews where people really wanted to hear about Hurricane Katrina and the New Orleans levees. And I consistently responded by reminding folks that there are other communities at risk as well, and that there was more to the story than just whether the city of New Orleans would be hit or would be spared. Hurricane Ida resulted in immense housing challenges not just in terms of the devastation, but also in terms of temporary housing and the return to permanent housing. There's a lot of heirs property along the coast, places where there isn't clear title. There are multiple families living in units or multiple families who have trailers or other units on someone else's land. All of these things really complicate recovery. This piece in the New York Times documented the fact that some folks were still in tents three months after the storm. Some people are still in tents today. Some people are still sleeping rough from Hurricane Laura in Southwest Louisiana over a year ago. So another part of my work has been to try to identify policy solutions and try to bring attention to these needs. The tribal communities in coastal Louisiana are state recognized, but not federally recognized. So they didn't have a direct line to the Federal Emergency Management Agency. They also had very limited ability to reach out to the state and to their parishes. In fact, a lot of the food, water, supplies like generators that came down to those tribes were driven down by folks such as myself. We were able to obtain donations. Several students actually, including students in the Durla program, volunteered their time to help drive materials down. So mutual aid was important and was a part of this, but mutual aid should not necessarily be the solution given the extent of the devastation we were also able to do some assistance with case management and able to do some assistance with fundraising. Given the challenges of even just being in touch of communications, tribal leaders were driving over an hour 
to get to a location where they could send a few text messages to partners and allies who were located in New Orleans or places further away who had better access to service, who could then advocate on their behalf. So how do we bring about real change? How do we move towards action as opposed to just applying band-aids and relying on communities to have the resources for mutual aid, sometimes in spite of government actions that make it harder to recover? First, I would suggest that it's very important to think about processes, not just projects and actions, and to always ask who is not at the table Anytime that we, who are considered experts and sometimes have a position of privilege, are at a table to look around and see if there are community voices there, not just those of us who try to elevate their voices. Deep engagement with communities, which takes time. I've known some of the coastal communities for close to 20 years, have deep personal relationships. It's very difficult to build those relationships when there is a particular project at hand, when there is a planning process, and those relationships take time and energy to sustain. It's also very important to explicitly recognize equity as a goal and then to measure, to look not just at outcomes through an equity lens, but to do process evaluation and ask periodically whether or not we're being successful at promoting more equitable outcomes. And it's also tremendously important to understand the historic drivers of risk in communities, to take the time to listen and to learn. How can you get involved? Well, certainly you can volunteer, you can participate in mutual aid networks, you can keep an eye out for inequity and help to elevate the voices of community members. You can also participate in public processes. The National Climate Assessment is being worked on right now. I'm an author for the Human Social Systems chapter. This will be the first time that the National Climate Assessment includes such a chapter and we'll be including an environmental justice lens. There's an opportunity right now to comment on all of the zero order drafts, and there will be several more opportunities moving forward. And there are also opportunities within the state as well to be engaged as agencies such as CPRA make decisions relative to adaptation. And we should always be asking who is being asked to adapt and who isn't, who is being asked to bear the cost, and whose lives are being valued and whose are not. Thank you. I think yeah, we still get yeah, for Ross. Yeah, I think for Ross. Yeah. I believe it's uh, Professor Sanders and I that have, have yet to go. So I'm just gonna jump in and start sharing my screen. Please let me know if the captioning is working. Okay. All right, can everybody see and hear me fine? Yes, we can. Thank you, Faraz. Perfect. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, it's really wonderful to see you. My name is Faraz Khan. I use he, him pronouns. For my friends who are not able to see me, I'm wearing a uh, black windbreaker and a free Palestine t-shirt. I'm from the uh, Dola class of 2021. I just recently graduated, and I'll soon be starting a position at uh, Dillard University in New Orleans as a researcher and instructor of disaster resilience equity. I'm definitely um, happy to be the, the, the young, fresh student baby of the panel. Um, and I just wanted to share a few kind of specific perspectives that I had. These are all pictures from when I was in New Orleans during Hurricane Ida. I have a bicycle, so I couldn't evacuate. Uh, and so a lot of what I describe will be from the perspective of someone who both lived through the experience and also tried to get involved with, with some of these groups and what some of my reflections are. Um, I wanted to begin with this quote that I actually uh, read on my first semester of being an, in Derla. It was introduced to me by Professor Jeanette Haney. Um, and I, I, yeah, I just want to read it out. It's, it's, it's by someone who survived the uh, 2020 explosion in Beirut in Lebanon. 
Resilience romanticizes our loss and dispossession. It brands our survival, making it an object of fascination for foreigners and inspiration for locals, advertising it as a valorized mode of attachment. Resilience is a marketing stunt for a political and economic system that runs on crises, that manufactures crises in order to sustain itself. Resilience celebrates survival at the expense of justice. It's the rhetorical and symbolic symptom of the normalization of injustice. Um, that's a, that's kind of weighty. Uh, and I, I want to talk to you about how I've been thinking through this process as someone who's coming here to study resilience at the exact moment in history that resilience as a concept is so at risk of being co-opted or so, so, so actively being mobilized by the same forces that are trying to hollow out its meaning and just encourage us to survive the crises that they generate. Uh, earlier when Corey was talking about the idea of reaping and sowing and you know what, what we're seeing now is, 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 a, is a result of long histories of dispossession and, and, and so on, the thought definitely came to my mind, you know, who's the we who, who's reaping and who's the we who's sowing? Uh, and and I, I really want to, to call attention to that because to me, it reflects a lot of what the, the work is ahead of us. So I'm just going to summarize everything that I have to say in three quick takeaways. Um, much of what is happening to support people after disaster is not happening in institutional realms. I think my view on this is as a, as a, as a young person entering the field, I want to let 100 flowers bloom folks that want to work on programs, that want to work on processes, uh, as, as Dr. Vieralman was saying, and, and that want to work on you know, improving these institutions to make them more responsive to people's needs. I think I salute that. I think that's something that's critical. But it's also something that I, in my experience of, 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 of being uh, involved in some of these activities during Hurricane Ida, um, so, <laughs> a, a crucial thing that I saw was that you know, a lot of what people would do to get help wasn't captured within the realm of, oh, I'm going to make a FEMA application or I'm going to do this. It's, you know, posting your cash app on Instagram. It's reaching out to a mutual aid group. It's calling on neighbors and friends for groceries. And, you know, there are definitely drawbacks to this. We, we, we study in the Derla program the, the perils of sort of vigilante disaster response and the effect of volunteer groups. But my submission there is that, you know, since the age of COVID-19, since the rise of these mutual aid groups, I think there's something that the word volunteer doesn't quite capture when, when talking about people who are involved in meeting some of the needs of their communities on a direct level. And it was fascinating to me. One story that I'll tell that, you know, talks about the interplay between these big institutions and not is, is I think it was day five or six of the power outage. And I was with some friends from different mutual aid groups and, and socialist organizations here in New Orleans. And we were doing some deliveries to drop off food uh, at elders' houses who were, who, who, and, and people who are not mobile. Um, and we were very excited to get the food because we thought it was something that, you know, someone had just cooked in their house. Uh, and we got there and it was 300 packets of World Central Kitchen food that I was involved with two days before helping to pack the, the sandwiches for. And, and that was a moment that, you know, we, we all kind of laughed because we, we knew at the same time that, yeah, actually people are very excited to eat World Central Kitchen food because it's tasty, it's delicious. They've, they, they have, as, as a large organization, successfully uh, uh, created a work stream or, or, or a workflow that meets people's needs and that people are excited to, to eat the food of. There are organizations that will show up with food where people are not excited. And, and, and that's something that I saw that was kind of amusing, but also kind of distressing at the same time. So you bring this World Central Kitchen food that, you know, several of us were volunteers to help pack and, and, and create uh, a, a few days before. And we, we bring it to people and we, we got to see that, you know, unique moment of recognizing that, you know, the big institutions have some capacity to mobilize resources at one level, but the people who actually end up, you know, bringing these things to the, to the front lines, bringing these things to people in ways that directly meet their needs are often not part of those big institutions. Um, so that's one of my reflections. I think the, the, the other one is this question of uh, resilience being co-opted. I've often, you know, had this reflection uh, as, as I study resilience and, you know, I, 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 I come from Singapore. I was brought to the United States on a U.S. Singapore Fulbright to study disasters. Uh, and I have done some work in the Global South, in Nepal, in Thailand. And I think one of the main things that I've come to realize is that there's a real need to learn to have these inside outside conversations. Uh, what, what I mean by that is, you know, it's, it's one thing when your employer who is underpaying you tells you that you should start doing yoga and, and meditation and journaling 
to try and improve your well-being and resilience. It's another thing when a comrade who is in the same in, in a similar position as as you are, or, or a friend is is offering you some of those resources and, and, and support. And it's important to kind of pay attention to when those dynamics are happening and, 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 and how we can have these conversations and help people build their individual resilience in a way that actually respects the, 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 the source of the root causes of the crisis that they're in. I mean, the final takeaway I have is really just that our task ahead is to build something with our own resources because we recognize, or at least I recognize, that there is a critique of these, these major institutions and the ways that they have consistently failed to meet the needs of people despite reforms and often because of reforms. Um, and so, you know, there are many, many projects to celebrate, particularly here in Louisiana and all across the South, especially the Gulf South, of people retur re returning to what I'll call the first principles of community land, food and health projects for food sovereignty, projects for housing uh, reconstruction. So I'm, I'm excited about that. I think I'm inspired about it. Uh, if, if folks are interested in getting involved, I think I'd be very, very happy to, to, to talk about that in the, in the comments or, 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 or with people individually. I think a lot, of, a lot of this activity really is not documented or really is not necessarily institutionally clear. Um, and so, yeah, I, I definitely recommend getting in touch with some of these networks and seeing where that takes people. Um, but yeah, that's all. Thank you so much for listening. And I'm very excited to get into the discussion. Right. Thank you, Faraz, and thank you to my other panelists. I am grateful to have gone behind you because your experience is the bridge between the prior panelists discussing mutual aid and what I'm going to talk about from a more institutionally international perspective is the disconnect between institutions and the people that they serve as a factor of equity and about risk and resilience building. But first, I'll introduce myself. I'm Monica Sanders. I'm a senior fellow at Derla. I am so happy to be working for the second time on the institutes, the theme of which coming this spring and into the summer will be climate ex Jedi. So we're talking about justice, equity, diversion, diversity and inclusion as factors of climate resilience and disaster equity and other intersecting themes. I'm also a professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center and most recently the founder of a project called The Undivide Project, which looks at the intersection of digital divestment in communities and a lack of climate and disaster resilience. Equity to me, what this means in this context or any context is a nomenclature that we've taken on as a way of trying to wrestle with past harms. You cannot have equity. You cannot truly have resilience or adaptation when we're talking about marginalized communities or priority communities or whatever terminology you want to use without justice. And justice is comprised for me of three things. It's taking responsibility for past harms. So if we're talking about it in the United States context, it's understanding that those were policy and law decisions that created what we call marginalized groups and understanding that the future forward planning must include an undoing and a reconciliation of those harms. If we're looking at it from an international perspective and having a conversation about loss and damage, it's understanding as Dr. Ferrer pointed out, the scars of colonialism and imperialism and that there has to be a responsibility taking which should inevitably lead us to redress. That paying for current costs of things is not sufficient, that we still have to recognize it there's an enduring and generational harm from every perspective that you can think of that needs to be redressed before these communities and certain sections of our globe can move forward. And finally, reframing the way we think about institutions. So to get to what Faraz very beautifully pointed out in his on the ground experience is there is a disconnect between the operations of institutions, whether it be the federal government in the United States, intergovernmental communities, from institutions, excuse me, or sovereigns themselves and what's happening on the ground. And so part of that is rethinking how we work with communities, going from some of the models, we talk about participatory action, we talk about co-work, co-benefits, but it's really about truly engaging and being parts of communities and understanding their reality. And rather than encouraging the people to join the structure of the institution, understanding that institutions and the thinking around them needs to be reframed to truly meet the needs of communities is what equity means to me. Um, I carry that through in my work. So a couple of things that I do, I'm part of the World Bank Disaster Risk Reduction Facility. I also 
and part of a EU think tank that looks at climate change and disaster adaptation and resilience and exactly how do we make these things have true meaning to communities? And then how do we use the community's reality to influence policy and legal decision-making? Also as a native of Louisiana, I have done a lot of on the ground work with Team Rubicon um, as some, one of my colleagues represents, um, both in Louisiana and in Virginia where I currently live. And I've also been involved in an organization called Resilient Virginia that looks at some of the things that a coastal state that's still at the beginnings of its conversation about equity and adaptation needs to do to serve all communities. Part of that is actually working at the intersection of what my organization is about is understanding that when you have communities that are unbanked and unconnected to the internet, you have communities that are disconnected from disaster response organizations. You go online to access FEMA benefits. You go online to look at social media to get alerts and warnings more often than not. You do your banking online. So if you are unbanked and you are unconnected, then you fall out of the side of institutions. And so how do we do our statewide, our sovereign wide, our international planning to take some of these things into account and plan for reaching those people. Not to do away with the need for mutual aid, but understand that when you have a system like that or occurrences like that in place, that is not just an unseen factor of disasters that connotes that there is a gap in your planning and your system that needs to be reframed. Um, what is next? What's next is true deep in community engagement, community-led engagement is part of our conversation. The existence of different levels of activism that we've seen, understanding that social justice and racial justice and gender justice intersect with what we are talking about. That should be part of our conversation. Disability justice should be part of our conversation. As we create this increasingly digital society, it's not just about economic or career political benefits, it's about understanding that this is a new kinds of commons and that disasters impact those commons, that climate adaptation is exacerbated by the existence of these frameworks, but also the adaptation to it could be enhanced or detracted from depending on how we approach it. So how do we have that conversation? And how do we have it in such a way that it includes all of the right voices? And then finally is reframing activism and who should be activating because oftentimes the call to activate is on a burdened community after harms have been done to them, as opposed to looking at activism around climate adaptation and resilience as a whole of community, a whole of society, continuous process. If we're gonna go back to what I said about equity being non-existent without justice. And with that, how do you get involved? Well, you can take some of the courses or institutes or some of the offerings that Tulane and other institutions have. You can volunteer. Any of the organizations that people here have talked about have a volunteer, volunteerism arm. Advocacy is always a great part of it. We have people in the participants roster that I see are varying levels of agency and expertise. And so responding to federal registers, writing to organizations are all great ways to get involved. And then also there's a final one is just simply come and work in this space. Everyone here comes from a different discipline and brings a different perspective. And so the nice thing about when we're talking about this broad tent of disasters and climate change is that there are all kinds of opportunities. So if you're interested in coming and doing this work, you should seek out opportunities to do so. And with that, thank you everyone for your attention and your participation. And I will turn it back over to Dr. Ferreira to guide us into the Q&A. Thank you, Monica, and thank you so much to all of our esteemed panelists. Um, amazing the work you're doing, and you know, thank you also for making Louisiana and the world a better place. Um, so if the audience have got any questions, please feel free to drop it for us um, in the chat. Dr. Ferrara, um, Rob Friedman has asked in the chat, I think the panelists can see it, but I, our audience can't see it and I'm gonna read it out for the recording. Um, so they ask, I'm curious what, oops, 
Um, I'm curious what y'all see as the missing link to facilitate greater accountability to frontline survivors by local, state, and federal agencies, as well as nonprofits. Thank you, Rob. Great question, Rob. Um, panelists? If, if I could, and I wouldn't necessarily call this the missing link because I think Rob asks a very complicated question, but I think part of it is reframing um, how it is that we collectively and the agencies and institutions as well uh, think about um, frontline survivors. Uh, one of the things that tends to happen is that frontline survivors are asked to justify their needs as opposed to us asking government and other institutions to justify the failure to provide assistance. Right? So who do we burden? We burden the survivors with, with showing um, worth and need. And, and that's a very problematic framing. But the other thing that I would suggest is that it would also be important to move away from what I would call a charity framing um, as opposed to a human rights framing. And so the notion that when assistance is given to persons by organizations, by institutions, uh, th that persons shouldn't have a voice. They should just be grateful, right? You shouldn't necessarily get to request something different. And I, I realize that that's perhaps an oversimplification and that it is difficult for organizations and institutions to meet every level of unique need. But if we're really going to account for the needs that individuals have, we're going to have to have some dialogue or we're, if nothing else, going to waste resources, right? Where perhaps we're providing what isn't needed or providing it in the ways that aren't most appropriate. You know, Rob, thank you for your question. And I would just answer it by saying, it's quite simple, is you treat so-called frontline survivors the same way that you treat people from priority neighborhoods. There's no reason why Puerto Ricans should be treated any differently than survivors in the cliffs of California. Where we get into this in our studies and our activities around whatever you wanna call them, as I said, it's just simply nomenclature, is that it's a frontline community, it's a marginalized community. No, it's a community. We have no problem doing bespoke responses to people in wealthy neighborhoods. So that's not a question. We have absolutely no problem making sure full insurance coverage goes to high tax base communities. So the accountability should be you treat them the way that you treat the highest income neighborhoods without adding any kind of nomenclature to it. You have the same kind of accountability because I live in a neighborhood that has one of the highest median incomes in the DC area. When someone from this neighborhood calls their congressman or calls FEMA, they get an immediate response. A colleague just across the river chooses to live in a neighborhood in an opposite situation and there's no response. So it's not about accountability. It's about a mindset that needs to be rethought, that you treat communities, every community, as a high priority community. Yeah, and if I could just add maybe a couple points and uh, I was furiously taking notes. Uh, so thank you, Alessandra and, and Monica for that. Um, you know, the two domains I think of is we've seen huge divestment in journalism in the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, we need individuals that are journalists. We need individuals that are willing to be entrepreneurs in journalism to ensure that there is more coverage across all impacted communities uh, covering these topics. That's number one. Number two is um, there's significant opportunity for more and more people to choose to join institutions, right? Whether that's federal agencies, whether that's state government agencies, whether that's nonprofits, local or national or international, to force ourselves to ensure that our first action as individuals within institutions is to advocate for the individuals that the organizations or the institutions exist for because sometime at some point over the course of organizations being created and maturing and evolving, sometimes that forefront of mind of the individual in which the organization was created to serve starts to become secondary or tertiary in the decision-making around where investment and where resourcing can happen. And so we need more and more individuals to ensure that they are committing to, to careers in these institutions that 
you know, they're advocates first and foremost, and then they're program managers, and then they're, you know, CFOs, and then they're COOs in these organizations. So thank you all. Thank you, Corey. Um, I see there's a number of questions coming in, so I want to make sure we're able to answer all of them. Um, Carrie, are you going to read them or should I read them? Uh, yes, I'm, ha I'm happy to. Thank you. Um, sorry. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, I'm going to go into chat first uh, because I think those are the ones that folks can't see. Um, so this one is coming from Chris. They ask, um, so hard to frame this on Zoom, so I hope this makes sense. Can anyone speak on the disconnect between the stated and proven realities of scars of colonialism? and racism slash white supremacy embedded within all systems and the panelists multiple methods to address it and its intersections with continually louder responses. And then in parentheses, it says through state governments, actions, the electorate, all right, et cetera, that either denies these realities or responds with policies to prevent your perspectives from being disseminated. And those would be for things like climate de denialism, outlawing CRT, et cetera. Thank you for the question, Chris. Anyone wants to have a stab at this one? Personally, I think you know it's important that we address the root causes of vulnerability. And I mean, it's everything you mentioned here, Chris. So I mean, we need to address it. But you know, it's basically where's the starting point for us? Um, you know, because there's a lot of talk. You know, so we have to figure out that starting point sooner than later, um, panelists. I mean, I, I think it goes to a lot of what Alessandra and Monica have been stating about how we reframe. You know, one, we have to um, be very explicit with how we uh, approach, whether it's recovery efforts, like what Team Rubicon does and, and targeting and, you know, looking at who is getting insurance money back, who is getting uh, FEMA assistance and helping uh, um, in these current structures and, and trying to advocate for those who are not getting the resources in these structures. But again, it's like advocacy work, you know, getting the communities involved, building those relationships, ensuring that everyone has a voice at the table and, you know, the mitigation prior to and the response afterwards. Um, but it's a multifaceted um, approach that I don't think there's one, one quick fix. I think it will take um, all of us collectively um attacking this and again ensuring that all voices are heard and are at the table and part of the planning thank you mark anyone else in the panel wants to have a go i think um I, I would just add that this is also where it becomes very important to be certain that our efforts are not a historic um, because a lot of policies that seem technically very sound perpetuate systemic challenges that have their roots back to our property ownership structures, um, the history of, of enslavement. And so if you look, for example, at the limitations that owners of heirs property have in interacting with federal systems, if we simply create mechanisms for aid that treat everybody the same, uh, we then ignore what that legacy has created as far as people's ability to interact with the systems. Thank you, Alessandra. I think if, if I can just jump in here, one last thing I want to add, you know, as someone who is not a US citizen, I think often when I hear things about, oh, and like climate change denialism, anti-CRT, alt-right backlash, and so on, you know, there's a recognition that these are international phenomena, but there is also a uniquely American component to how some of these movements are unfolding. Um, and I do feel like there is, a, you know, maybe not the, conversation in, in this webinar, but there is a conversation to be had about how the disaster mitigation or climate adaptation communities are engaging with these in, in, in these spaces, you know, how do we talk to the alt right about infrastructure, how do we like have some of these conversations to begin with and is conversation even the right realm for it right like, like, would our efforts be much better spent in, in, in other places where there is an actual state of need. I, I'm not convinced. I, I, I'm, I genuinely feel like this is a question that, you know, uh, Americans in this space will have to answer in the next 10 to 15 years, but I'm very curious about how it will unfold. And I think that's, a, that's an entirely fair set of examples to bring up. 
Thank you, Feroz. Kerry, I think we can move on to the next question. Okay, wonderful. This one comes from Kendra. Uh, we have found an increasing challenge to getting community inclusion or locally driven recovery due to the grants processes, and most are going to large for-profit firms. Do any of you have advice on helping communities get involved in this space to getting grant money to locals versus state level contracts? Thank you for that question, Kendra. And um, I see Professor Sanders is smiling. Um, Derla, Georgetown, and Dillard actually received funding recently. Um, April, it will be announced um, fully, you know, for public consumption, but our grant is actually focused on working with non-for-profit community-based grassroots organizations, um, you know, where it's a collaborative approach where, you know, we're going to be working on developing those grant writing skills and really cut out the disaster capitalism, almost like vulture nature that's sometimes associated with the field. Um, you know, so from our end, you know, we're really trying to build out a training program. But, um, you know, there are several of our panelists that actually work in the field, and I'm sure they might have some valuable advice as well. Dr. Sanders, I'll, I'll cede to you. I do have a quick comment, but I'll cede to you. I was looking at you, Corey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, two or three quick points, Kendra, uh, and it's nice to see your name pop up in the chat. Uh, first and foremost, would love to love to talk through this with you and, and more than willing to, to try to ideate around resourcing. Um, all I will say very quickly is um, uh, there are some really neat examples of this happening. Um, now, what we define as local, we probably need to define that a little bit more. But as an example, um, as an example, uh, my team is currently partnered with a local nonprofit in the state of Colorado right now, uh, partnering to create recovery and resilience plans coming out of COVID-19, but really looking at it from a from a climate adaptation perspective with all sorts of through lines, uh, economic economic sustainability, hazard mitigation, you know, et cetera. And the majority, I want to say the majority of those um, those firms that are supporting the, uh, that work are nonprofits, even additionally from the, the work we're directly doing. And then another really neat example, we'll find out if uh, we're able to support it, but literally in the last couple of days, partnered with two other nonprofits in a state in the Northeast uh, to ensure that the funding stays locally within those nonprofits as much as possible, but then getting the subject matter expertise that might exist um, you know, elsewhere in the country um, that perhaps has experienced some of those impacts. Yeah, I think all of those are great examples. And the only thing I would add, you know, as I said in my statement that I'm one for reframing processes and institutions. And so also I'm an attorney, so it's Professor Sanders and not Dr. Sanders, but thanks for the promotion, Corey. And I love being an attorney. Case in point is that in the Disaster Recovery Reform Act, there is a provision that specifically holds FEMA to providing technical assistance to communities in the granting process. And so part of it, you know, working with the Gullah Geechee community is helping them make that real and know that they not only have a moral and programmatic obligation to do so, but a legal obligation to do so. And so making sure that they think through some of their regulatory requirements for things like fiscal agency, because that often traps up community-based organizations and smaller organizations as meeting the standard of what it means to be able to manage a federal grant. And so that's one of the things that, you know, we're working on with some of my students at the law center and holding that legal accountability and getting them to make the regulatory adjustments so that it becomes reality. And then also the same thing happens with large foundations. We are fortunate to be able to do this work with our three universities because we have the expertise in the agency to reach out to large foundations and receive funding. Um, a lot of these large foundations haven't considered doing things like micro grants and community-based granting programs so that it's accessible. And I know your question was how can we get organizations involved, but I'm very aware of putting the burden, an extra burden on a small organization to advocate for themselves when the reverse should be happening. And so PNC Bank is another partner that's rethinking some of its community work to do micro grants so that it's more accessible and more 
um, sustainable for smaller organizations to reach out to. And so there's some others that we're working with. If you want some specific contacts, Kendra, I'm happy to offer those to you. But overall, that's my advice. Like I appreciate, you know, on either end, you have someone who's working on the ground with a, a wide berth of expertise, but then you also have someone that's looking at changing the framework that causes these things to actually happen. So thank you for that. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, Monica. Um, Kerry, I think we have three more questions. Um, so yeah, I, I believe the two questions in the chat are have sort of been addressed, but you know, I mean, let's let's just read them, please. Yeah, sure, of course. Um, so we have from from Dr. Hayes. What are the current legislative priorities? a very short one and, and just for clarification i'm just thinking about in terms of organizing and as we look at the new legislative sessions coming in you know what would you consider priorities to um to locally uh yeah. statewide that, that we would lobby yeah. for um in terms of climate change right. and We have two legal experts here with um, Dr. Jeroleman and Professor Sanders. So I'm going to popcorn that to you all. One thing that I think is a priority um, for the state of Louisiana is that as we do look towards uh, things like updating the coastal master plan, as we look towards revising disaster planning in general, for example, pre-disaster planning for post-disaster housing recovery, that we always actively lobby to ensure that equity is taken into account and that there are mechanisms put in to avoid unintended consequences and so that our adaptation efforts don't drive gentrification. So as we look, for example, to do things, hopefully like someday incorporate freeboard into elevation, which would be a very good thing from the perspective of safety or higher codes for wind safety, that we do so in ways that also provide assistance um, to people on fixed incomes, people whose properties are already paid off, who would find that an insurmountable barrier to recovery. Yeah, I would say that and then state specific to Louisiana, I would not call it a legislative priority, but even more so a budgetary priority, because when you look at the city of New Orleans fiscal year this year going forward to 2025, and then when you look at the state budget, discounting the funds spent for COVID response such as it has been, there is a significant drop off between available funds for anything and budget priorities that have been propped up by the influx of federal funding as far back as Katrina recovery, because for a variety of reasons, we didn't honestly start that until 29, 2010, all the way through Ida and Laura, Laura. So we've got a critical issue here with federal funding that has a sunset and the need for the state to reorganize its adaptation and resilience building priorities, signs such funding, which is episodic in nature and sunsets in building a sustainable budget around how to do this. And so that's also where activism comes into play because political will is an important part of such conversations and that doesn't self-generate is all I'm gonna say about that. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Um, we have about 10 minutes left and I think we still have three questions. Um, yeah. yeah, so this one is from Eric, it's from the chat and then we'll do the two in the Q and A. Um, uh, this is uh, with the comment about journalism as a segue, FEMA dollars tend to follow CNN coverage of disasters where greater intrinsic vulnerability may be quote unquote off camera. How do marginalized communities compete for these dollars in the response and into the recovery phase? I think it's uh, similar to what has been discussed several times. Uh, by panelists throughout it's like you know we don't want to put that extra burden on the marginalized community to advocate for themselves but how do people in institutions whether it be fema whether it be nonprofits or other you know community organizations how can they advocate that those dollars are spent in the marginalized communities you know team rubicon we kind of look at 
after a hazard event, wherever it is, look at you know SVI data um, as a as a large uh, decision making point um, in terms of you know, but it sits at a higher level than true granularity can help with some of these communities, you know. So we have to get boots on the ground, going back to trying to localize our responses, having community members be a part of our response, but even with it not being uh, Team Rubicon, you know, getting those voices of those marginalized communities as part of the recovery and the response process um, from the very beginning. Thank you, Mark. Any one of our other panelists maybe want to have a go? Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question, Eric. Oh, great. We're going to jump over to uh, the Q&A uh, from Michael. Are panelists concerned that the rapid pace of the climate crisis and the disasters generated will overwhelm efforts to respond with equity and justice? I'll give a, a partial answer to that. I mean, certainly, yes, and I'm concerned that both communities and the agencies and organizations that work to support them are facing just compounding events, right? One on top of the other. And we can't really think about the disaster cycle anymore. It's all happening at once. We're in multiple recoveries while we're, while we're dealing with new events. What scares me the most, though, is that the feeling that we're so overwhelmed, the feeling that we're in a crisis actually leads people and organizations to advocate against equity in certain ways, to suggest that we have this urgency of the moment where we need to do what we can. And that means that there will be some winners and there will be some losers so that perhaps we can't invest as much in some of the more unique needs, but instead need to look across risk nationally and make some, you know, quote unquote, tough choices. And those tend to be done based on economic prioritization and not necessarily consider other aspects as well. Thank you, Alessandra. Anyone else? Or I think just a, a quick Point, I would just offer it, it goes in all directions of resources that are available to any given community, right? So I think this goes in the direction of ensuring that legislatures are uh, staying on top of insurance providers, as we're seeing play out in the state of California right now around insurance uh, and the wildland urban interface that's happening. It goes to, you know, from a corporate perspective of where corporations are providing living wages to their staff, as well as their corporate social responsibility framing. And so it's the opportunity is to, to keep pressure to ensure that more is continually allocated and, and provided in addition to, you know, federal assistance and state assistance, which um, I think has been the majority of the conversation here today. Thank you, Corey. And thank you, Michael, for the question. Um, and our, our last question from the Q&A from Lynn, it seems incredibly important to involve local communities to support equity. What are the best ways to involve those communities in a positive way? It can take years to develop a trustful working relationship, but when respond to a disaster, that relationship needs to be developed immediately. What's the best way to do that? Thank you, Carrie, and thank you, Lynn, for the question. Um, on my end, you know, it's definitely address imperialism, leave that at the door, you know, work with a community. Um, don't tell a community what they should do. Um, the community needs to tell you what they want at the end of the day. That's just my takeaway. You know, I would just say very quickly to make the relationship building part of your planning because you say it needs to happen immediately, but oftentimes the kinds of things that you're talking about overcoming mistrust in institutions, mistrust in processes develop over time. And so undoing it has to happen over time. 
So the lesson I learned from the humanitarian community is that there are always people in those communities representing those agencies in some way, shape or form, many of them locally hired folks that know the culture and the context and are able to inform the response when that critical moment comes. And so what I would say, whatever context you're in, it should be part of your planning. And then if for whatever reason it hasn't had, like we're having this conversation today and God forbid a big event happens tomorrow, then you know it's what Dr. Ferreira says, you have to leave the presumptions and the imperialism and the baggage ahead and let the community lead you. Thank you, Monica. Well, I want to thank everyone today for taking time, um, you know, out of your busy days. Um, the first of all, thank you to our attendees. Um, thank you to Dr. Parquet, Dr. Hayes, Kerry, and Jeremy for organizing this event. And then most important, thank you so much, panelists. Really appreciate your time sharing your wealth of knowledge with us today. And thank you what you do for the Academy, Tona and I and Tulane School of Social Work. It's really proud that you're affiliated with us um, and what you do for our students. Thank you. So I'm going to hand over to Dr. Parquet. Thank, thank you so much, Reggie. Now, you all probably know that there's a lot of confusion in the School of Social Work where there are two Reggies. Okay. So uh, I, I have designated myself as Reggie 1 and uh, Reggie F as Reggie 2. So in the future, you all can refer to us that way. But I, I want to just echo what Reggie mentioned. We truly, truly appreciate the panel. We appreciate the enlightenment that you all shared with us. Uh, we certainly appreciate the questions that our participants pose. And uh, there, there was some, you know, common themes that um, as you all were talking and presenting, I, I, I thought about some of those common themes uh, and, and phrases and terms that you all mentioned were things like humanize, right? Holistic, access. And not just access, but access that produces outcomes. Equity was mentioned, justice. And the association between equity and justice. You all talked about relationship building, that everyone has a voice. And I was really, really moved by this, uh, this phrase, resilience as an act of care. Very moving, very powerful. Expertise. We talked about expertise, and I think it's important to note that uh, in many instances, the clients are the real experts, and that we have to hear their voices and get their input. Uh, someone from our, our participating audience raised the issue about white supremacy. And I, I was really pleased that that issue was raised because I think that if we don't understand uh, the insidious nature of white supremacy and how it impacts this topic that we're discussing today, we may get a little bit um, confused. So I appreciate that uh, issue was raised. You know, I, I'm also curious about whether, and I'd like to hear from the panel, on this, whether or not uh, human suffering from disasters is, is uh, uh, commodified. Do we, are, are there really people in places and institutions that, that make money off of human suffering? Uh, could, could someone respond to that just briefly, please? Parkai, I would say yes, but I mean, obviously, we have our panels that are the experts. So, the short answer is yes, uh, and I think that's part of what uh, Professor Sanders spoke to around addressing justice before we can even move towards equity. And so, I think we have to realize the the system in which this country operates in from an economic perspective. Mm -hmm. And we all individually and then corporately or individually community and corporately have to wrestle with what does, what should that look like and what's our opportunity to contribute to that. As I shared with you all briefly, um, 
having worked in this space for the better part of the last 15 years, this last year is the first time I've worked in this space in a for-profit context, which is a very interesting space to, to navigate and to wrestle with. And um, I'm very much learn, I'm in a state of learning every single day as much as I am hopefully, uh, you know, supporting individuals and communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gord. I, I was also touched, if you will, by something that uh, Professor Sanders mentioned. And I'm going to couch it as technology. You know, the, the fact that even to be uh, recognized on the radar for help, some people need computers and internet access. And, and for a lot of the marginalized communities that we all work in, uh, that can be a barrier. You know? uh, what are some ways that we can help eliminate that particular barrier, barrier as it relates to technology and access? Would you like me to answer that, sir? <laughs> I, 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 don't, I, I would like you to, but everybody was looking at you, Monica. <laughs> Um, well, the first thing is when we talk about the digital divide broadly, what happens is, is we get a map and it shows us where people are not connected and there the conversation ends. And so there's no real inquiry into communities about what they actually need, how they need to be connected and what kinds of equipment they need, right? Because without getting into the intricacies of it, what people in low-lying areas of Louisiana need to connect to the internet so that they can have a computer or a phone connected to Wi-Fi is very different than what people in Baton Rouge would need. And so that's the first piece of it is understanding from a geography and economic standpoint what communities need. And then also the humanizing piece of it is that in any given community, you might have elders who need to access social benefits you may have a disabled population that needs specialized equipment and access. You may have folks who need for their kids to go to school online. And so discerning that and making sure that it's a bespoke solution. But the other piece of it is, is you know, what Kendra brought up in the conversation between she and Corey and I about funding. So the other big problem that we need to correct at the federal and state level is Louisiana has a broadband access pool of money who knows about it and how to access it and get it into the communities that need it is a giant question mark. Um, there's a big pool of funding from the federal government that says broadband and 5G, but the requirements, I read through them like brief was 30 pages long. And who in a community where you have to work to survive has time to read that and figure out what you need to do. So the way that we overcome that is we make the requirements to receive funding if you don't have it simple and easy to access. And then also we need to understand as people in control of resources that we need to give those resources in a way that is useful and accessible and operational for the communities that need it. So that's the answer to that from my perspective. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Sanders. And, and if, again, if I we could... want to thank each of you uh, for sharing, for enlightening us, not only for for identifying these issues, these important issues, but, but for providing solutions as well. And also providing a path for all of us to become involved and engaged through volunteerism. Uh, so I, I, I would hope that we can have all of you back again because there are a lot of things that we certainly did not even get to uh, touch. Uh, and, you know, you all have made an important contribution. You're continuing to make an important contribution to our society, and we love you and thank you for it. And Dante Hayes and I would love to have you all back. Also, uh, for our listening audience who are participating, remember that, that we're offering 1.5 CEUs uh, for this webinar. And uh, we look to have you all back as, uh, again. Dr. Hayes, any closing comments? Um, just to receive your CEUs, you must complete the evaluation. We'd appreciate it. And, and one last thing, I've got to give this shout out to Carrie. I mean, Carrie is uh, unbelievable. I, I, we could not do this without Carrie. Oh, yeah. I had to be honest <laughs> with all of you. So <laughs> Carrie, you deserve a big shout out for helping us put this together. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Carrie. <laughs> Uh, thank um, you all. That's very kind. And guys, next month, just to shout out for um, Black History Month, we are doing EDI and, and we are focusing on TSSW and our EDI efforts and um, looking at how we um, can use what we have done thus far to help others in other organizations to um, implement EDI um, programs. So hopefully we will see you next month. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys. Have a great weekend. Thank you, everybody.